Have you ever noticed in your travels across eastern North Carolina that the land and topography along our northern coastal plain is distinctly different from that along our southern coastline? If your answer is yes, then you're absolutely right. Today on Exploring North Carolina, we have three of our state's most experienced coastal geologists telling us about the underlying geology of North Carolina's two coast. They are Dorothea Ames, Dave Mallison, and Stan Riggs, all of the Department of Geological Sciences of East Carolina University. Exploring North Carolina was able to ask each about the differences between our northern and southern coastal plain. Dorothea has long supplied Exploring North Carolina with extraordinary maps and detailed analysis of coastal geology. David Mallison is an expert on coastal processes and sea level change. And finally, Stan Riggs, University Distinguished Professor and a member of the Science Panel advising the North Carolina Coastal Resources Commission, has spent almost 50 years researching change along the North Carolina coastline. I asked Dorothea Ames and Stan Riggs to describe the topography of North Carolina's northern and southern coastal plain. North of Carteret County, we have very low, vast expanse of lowland, whereas south, we have much higher land. And this is something that we know as, as, as folks when we come driving in from the Outer Banks. When we come in from Nags Head, for instance, we drive along Highway 64, and for, for a long time, we are driving through swamps and ditches on the side of the road full of water. We're very low as far as the elevation is concerned. Whereas when you come off of Bogue Banks, for instance, and you come to Cape Carteret, you immediately notice how you're climbing up and going uphill. So the difference then is right along that area between Carteret County. We have um, the Albemarle Embayment North. So the name itself implies low basin, which is basically what it is. It is a low basin that has collected a lot of sediments over time, a lot of muds and sands. These are settling, it's getting even lower. Whereas the southern part of the coast is built up on rock. The rock that you see everywhere around, that is rock that comes right there just below the surface, the Castle Hain rock, it's hard rock. So the geology underlying these areas is very different and the topography is therefore different. And so is our experience when we drive from the coast. So you come off of the beach at, at uh, Nags Head and you'll go 75 miles across low, flat, flat land until you get 75 miles till you get 20 foot elevation. In the southeastern, you take Wilmington or uh, come off Wrightsville Beach or off Emerald Isle, you go across the little skinny estuary that you have there and you rise to 40 feet, 50 feet within a mile or two of the coast. To understand the differences between our northern coastal plain and our southern beaches, you have to go back 200 million years. Well, 250 million years ago, we had a supercontinent where Africa, South America, North America, and Europe were all combined into one continent called Pangaea. And that existed for probably 50 million years, up to about 200 million years ago. And starting about 200 million years ago, we sort of began to rip open the Atlantic Ocean. And it sort of opened like, like you, a zipper. And you end up with a, a sawtooth break apart between, in the case of North Carolina and Africa, which 
the big hump of Africa, the Senegal part of Africa, sat up here against North Carolina. And as they ripped apart, it's big rip apart, an opening of this Atlantic Basin. And the, that, st that started about 200 million years ago. And it's still going on, and the Atlantic Ocean is still opening up. Well, the importance for North Carolina is twofold. One is that when it ripped apart, part of the ripoff here ended up producing a platform of crystalline rocks that, and a basin here. And the basin came over here with, with Africa. So the crystalline rocks or the basement rocks um, that came out of here are sitting over here off of Africa. And so southeastern North Carolina is on this platform. Okay, it's where it's not very deep to crystalline rocks. And then you go north towards uh, Virginia and Maryland, you, you drop off into a basin. And that basin is the part that's over here. And that basin has been filled with marine sediments that have formed ever since the Atlantic Ocean existed. I asked Dorothea Ames and Stan Riggs to describe the topography of North Carolina's northern and southern coastal plain. Well, I work um, a lot also with LIDAR maps. LIDAR uh, maps have been developed by airplanes flying over the land and they basically send light signals and they bounce back and then they process these light signals so they can actually tell where the signal came up very fast was a high area and took it slightly longer was a low layer. So we have the high and low, which is called the topography of a land. And so when you look at the LIDAR for North Carolina, it is very distinctly different in the northern part, north of Carteret County and south of Carteret County. In the northern area, it's very, very low for a long period of time for a, a great area. And in the Carteret County and south, the land rises very quickly right away from the coast. This whole business of depth to basement, uh, which is the granitic type rocks that occur, th these are really what makes up the Piedmont and the Appalachian Mountains that are now being buried by the sediment, marine sediments of the Atlantic Ocean. And as I mentioned, the Wilmington area is on this Carolina platform. So if you were to drill a hole in, at Wilmington or out at Cape Fear, you'd drill approximately 1,500 feet and you'd hit some kind of what we call basement rock, crystalline rock. Um, it might be granite, it might be another type of rock, but it's, it'd be about 1,500 feet down. You come up to Cape Lookout, which is uh, associated with the Carteret Peninsula and the Carteret area, which is this transition zone, um, we're down to about four to 5,000 feet. If we were to drill a hole to hit that same basement rock, and if we keep going north, when we, by the time we get to Cape Hatteras, it's 10,000 feet down. So it's a mile in the deep underneath Carteret County, roughly, and it's two miles deep underneath Cape Hatteras. You can see how this is going from the platform up here at 1,500 feet to four or 5,000 feet in Carteret County to 10,000 feet down here at Cape Hatteras. And in the, the same pattern or a similar pattern exists as you go from land to sea. Or if we start in the Piedmont, because these are the Piedmont type rocks, we start at the Piedmont, which is, let's start at I-95. You don't have to drill at all. The crystalline rocks are at the surface. They're in the riverbeds. Uh, they're in quarries at the surface. But as you start east, you dr start dropping off as, from zero here at I-95 to Greenville. You're down about 900 feet if you were to drill a hole here. And you keep going east to Little Washington. You're down uh, 1,500, 1,400, 1,500 feet. You keep going east. 
You get to Swan Quarter, you're 4,000, 4,500 feet down to that crystalline rock, and then Cape Hatteras, you're 10,000 feet down. So what we have is a wedge of marine sediments going like this from the edge of the Piedmont eastward into the Atlantic Ocean, building the continental margin, the coastal plain, the continental shelf, et cetera, as we go east. It is now clear to most scientists that sea level is rising. How much can we expect in North Carolina in coming decades? And will the rate of sea level rise be the same along our northern coast and our southern coastline? Stan Riggs unlocks this mystery. There's no question that North Carolina's sea level is rising. The science panel has documented it very clearly. Most of the science researchers have documented it. And the projections are that, that we will probably have a foot and a half to three foot rise um, by 2100. Could be higher, could be lower. On the other hand, we have the land area here that's doing its own thing. And so the northeastern section that's sinking ever so slightly, if the ocean out here is rising, then we're going to increase the relative rate of change between the northeastern section and the southeastern section. So if southeast is rising and sea level's rising, it's not going to be quite as much for the long-term impact on the coastal system. Now these differences aren't very big. We're not like the west coast tectonics with all the earthquakes and volcanoes and stuff. It's more subtle in North Carolina, but it's real. The northern coastal plain is filled with deep sediments from millions of years of erosion of the Appalachian Mountains and from marine sediments, while the southern coastal region is perched over crystalline rock. How will this affect sea level rise along the Tar Heel Coast? I ask Dave Mallison. You've got some complicated things going on in our coastal region. Um, and in the north, up around the Virginia, North Carolina uh, area, or actually just approaching that and going up through that region all the way up to New England, you have a, uh, an elevated surface, essentially, uh, which we call a, a glacial bore bulge uh, that is sinking. And what this is, is it's left over from when the ice sheets expanded over the northern hemisphere and that maximum expansion of the ice sheets occurred about 20,000 years ago roughly. That pressed down, much like somebody sitting on a waterbed, pressed down way up north, up in Canada essentially, and actually all the way down through New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, okay, pressed down there and forced our area and the New England area upwards. That's the glacial floor bulge. And since the glaciers retreated, that's been sinking. So you can imagine if you had a waterbed full of something that was very viscous, something like very, very cold syrup or something, you know, you can get that person off the waterbed, but it's gonna take a while for that to relax, that bulge to relax. Well, that's kind of what we're experiencing. Uh, as you go northward from North Carolina up into Virginia and up into New England. And so the rates of sinking there are in the range of about a millimeter per year. Um, and then so if, if the land surface is sinking there in the northern part and sea level is rising, well, what we refer to as relative sea, sea level, what you're seeing right there where you're living, if this is kind of the coastline, is actually the rate is is more rapid than what it is globally because the land is sinking out from under you as well. So you see that going on in the north and that rate decreases as you go towards the south. And then once you get to the area around Wilmington, which is all perched on top of this older crust kind of, it's, uh, there's actually a little bit of uplift of the land surface there. Over the years, exploring North Carolina has had access to a number of extraordinary maps detailing change on the North Carolina coast due to storms and the dynamic nature of the region. Dorothea Ames and Dave Mallison helped me to understand this process of constant change, both the destructive 
and constructive powers of the ocean. Well, maps can tell us a lot about the changes on the Barry Islands, and some of these changes are the movement of the coastline, as well as changes of the actual land forms on the Barry Islands. We're very fortunate in North Carolina to have a wonderful set of accurately surveyed topographic maps. These were done by the U.S. Coast Survey starting in the 18, late 1840s. And over the next two decades, they surveyed the entire Outer Banks of North Carolina. Now these maps can show us where the coastlines were, both the ocean shoreline as well as the sound side shoreline. And when we look at the maps of certain areas, for instance, just north of Buxton Village, we can see that the shorelines on both sides of the Barry Islands have come closer together, which means that we have had significant narrowing of the Barry Islands. In that same area, an inlet broke through in 1962. This inlet was closed in 1963, and see, looking at the maps and the aerial photographs, we can see that during the time, the span that that inlet was open, just a year, there was a huge flood tide delta built up on the sound side. Now a flood tide delta is a lot of sand that washes in with an inlet. And then once the inlet closes, the sand builds up through various processes, including when the waves wash over the Barry Island and bring more sand from the ocean side. This built up shallow sand flat will then vegetate and become part of the Barry Island. And this builds up the width of the Barry Island, which is very important for this Barry Island to continue over time. You have erosion of the shoreline, narrowing of the barrier islands. You get breaches during storms, which opens up an inlet, and that funnels a lot of sediment to the backside of the barrier. So that's, that's a really important process overall in maintaining the sediment within the whole barrier system. It, it causes the barrier island to widen and it allows a platform on the back side of the barriers for overwash, you know, during a storm to land on essentially and build the barrier vertically. In recent years, the East Carolina University Department of Geological Sciences and Dorothea Ames have relied on advanced LIDAR maps that she referenced earlier. These maps help us understand more clearly than any others the geological past of North Carolina's coast and what we can expect in the future. And we have these LIDAR maps that are more accurate than the old topographic maps on paper that we used to have at our disposal. When you look at these LIDAR maps, the colors tell the story. You will note that many square miles of northeastern North Carolina are at, or just a few feet above, sea level. And these areas will be the most impacted by rising seas in coming decades. Such maps should not be a cause for alarm, but should be viewed as an opportunity to make wise decisions for our coastal future for people, fisheries, and ecosystems. With low flat lands in the northeastern part of our state that are gradually subsiding, and ocean levels that are rising, what changes can we expect in the coming decades in the coastal region between Carteret County and the Virginia border? The inland areas are at sea level and just slightly above sea level, and so it's hard to make a living if you're going to have wet feet all the time. And, and so this area today is changing dramatically in response to this ongoing sea level rise. And so the barrier islands are moving rapidly. They will survive. We will always have a, a, an outer banks of some sort. It just won't be in the same place. They'll roll over themselves. They open up, they blow holes, they close down, they build the barriers, they overwash the top of them. This is the natural dynamics. Those, a barrier island is built by 
storms. It has to, it's maintained by storms. It has to have storms if we're going to change the system. If we've got climate change and sea level rise going on, you got to have a way for that beach system, which is dependent on the storms, that's the whole reason they're there, to evolve and move with them. And so we're going to continue to flood up the rivers, river valleys. Uh, the estuaries are going to move up to Greenville. We will have estuarine water in Greenville. If we get three foot rise, it'll be like Little Washington and, and New Bern today. Um, we will lose a lot of land out there. Half of counties, in some cases whole counties, are only a foot or two above sea level. The barrier islands will move, but they'll move on across the Hatteras Flats. They've got a long way to go before they, uh, we get a new set of barrier islands. But we have to remember that we've always had a, co a coastal system. We've always had beaches. We've always had barrier islands. And they move. They're dynamic. It's a high energy system. With a steeper terrain underlain by a rocky platform, already abutting the ocean in places. What changes can we expect along our south coast from Bogue Banks to the South Carolina line? The southeastern is going to continue to wrap around these headlands and we're going to get more and more rocky headlands and more and more uh, pocket beaches and the whole area of what we now have of back barrier marshes, those long skinny estuaries on the backside, the barriers will just roll over those, fill those in. There won't be any estuaries. If you have a strand plain beach with rocky headlands, you don't get an estuary back there. So those estuaries will be gone. Um, so the long-term evolution without humans is very clear. We know exactly how it's gonna happen. Uh, we know exactly where it'll be if you assume this much rise in sea level or this much rise in sea level. We, we understand the science of how these systems work. As people, we love being close to the water and how it lifts our spirits. But is it realistic to think that the ocean, which is always changing, will stop moving for us. I am sure people who build houses on the ocean would love to have it stop moving. But unfortunately, this does not happen because we have seen over time with rising sea levels that the shoreline does move landward no matter what happens. And building on the shoreline actually causes more erosion I have georeferenced and mapped shorelines, for instance, at South Nags Head over time, and seen that even before it was built up, the shoreline was moving landward, and it continued to do so after it was built up, and many rows of houses have gone into the water since then. So there is no way of really stopping the ocean. Unfortunately, the only thing we do by trying to stop the ocean is making matters worse. It is our hope that as you travel in Eastern North Carolina, you will begin to notice the topographical features, the differences on the surface between North and South, and think about the forces that built our coast. The more we understand the events that shaped our past, the better we can plan for the future of our magnificent coastal region. And I learned this while exploring North Carolina.